Hi, thank you so much for joining us in our next live session for the Massive Open Online course, Feeding a Hungry Planet by the SDG Academy. Today, we're thrilled to have Rebecca Nelson and Johannes Lehman, who are both professors at Cornell University, also joined by Professor Stephen Vanek from Colorado State University. And today we're gonna to be talking about soil health. Just a reminder, if you have any questions for our distinguished faculty, you can ask them using the chat field, which is either to the right or possibly below the video. Over to you, Rebecca. Great, yeah, well, thank you for being with us today. We're really happy to be tackling this exciting topic of soil health, which is, I think, very timely. It's getting a lot of attention these days. And uh, um, even today, I was having me uh, conversations about this with numerous people at a meeting in here where I am in France. So I'm very uh, uh, grateful to Johannes and Steve for joining today to take, take this up. So I'm playing the role of questioner, interrogator, since I don't know anything about soil health and they do. Uh, they have actually worked together in the past and um, uh, in many places in the world. So I'm really appreciating their uh, willingness to join us today. So let me start first with Johannes. Um, Johannes, could you tell us a bit about how you see the basic elements of soil health? What What is that? And how does it differ from soil fertility today? Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. And hello, everyone. Um, I'm sitting here in Ithaca. It's cold, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying being with you today. Um, soil health is, is uh, really an interesting concept that, that popped up uh, a couple of decades ago, timidly at first, um, and has now been the label of a lot of different uh, initiatives um, to put the spotlight on soil issues um, and improving food security and uh, um, and ecosystem services. So it's it uh, the the concept of soil health uh, broadens the um, uh, the the focus on just simply quality or fertility uh, explicitly with a view to um, eco uh, seeing the soil as an ecosystem. Uh, while we have seen uh, in the middle of the last century uh, soil quality and soil fertility management um, focus very much on input of chemicals, fertilizers, now the recognition that there is a huge um, microbiome uh, fauna, flora in the soil that determine uh, productivity as well, this focus to health and, and a more ecosystem recognition is, is a really great direction um, to, to and, and, and an even more um, uh, recent term is soil security that broadens it even further um, into you know, all kinds of uh, services that soils provide. So it's, it's a really uh, interesting and, and exciting development. Um, that is also not without without issues um, uh, because uh, no, we we uh, don't really know what a healthy soil is. We have sort of a notion um, that a healthy soil is when it does all the things that we think are good, such as um, uh, 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 making water, uh, filtrating water, promoting crop growth, um, uh, having low erosion. Um, then, then we think um, it's a healthy soil. But it, it, a, a um, clear analytics and clear uh, concrete definitions are have to be probably elusive. Another really interesting as aspect of, of soil health is, of course, it relates to human health in terminology, and and um, and I'll put then also the focus on how can we uh, produce nutritious food. Um, and have healthy ecosystems uh, for um, for all uh, organisms uh, in the world, not just producing simply more crop. So it's it's a really exciting uh, way forward that is still uh, feeling its way the the um, to, uh, around uh, terminology and and aspects and what it actually means, uh, but definitely going in the right direction. Okay, well, thank you, Johannes. Um, I, I'm going to ask Steve first, but then maybe, if, if you don't mind also chiming in, Johannes, um, to comment on some trends that you might be seeing in the work that you're doing in different parts of the world. Like, um, the, obviously, the health situation is going to be different from place to place. <coughs> but if you could, <coughs> human health seems to be... <coughs> yeah, human health. Right. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Yeah. If you could comment on, uh, go ahead. <laughs> That's fine. Yes. No. Thanks, and thanks for including me in the in this course. This is really nice, and I, I uh, glad to contribute. 
Um, yeah, so so I work. Uh, I worked with Giannis in the past, as you mentioned. I work. I am going to take your questions somewhat from the lens of of smallholder farming systems around the world. Although what I'm saying is not uh, not at all irrelevant to to more agricultural industrial systems, and maybe we'll get into a little bit of that those nuances later. Um, so, so I guess in terms of when we think of soil health, we might think of threats to that health and when we might think of trying to promote that health, uh, soil health proactively. And I guess that I think in my mind has been the story of, of um, kind of work with smallholders and recognizing the constraints that they often face uh, as uh, um, uh, in societies uh, that they, the, uh, so, so some threats to soil health there are, are Kind of the expansion of the agricultural frontier all around the world as populations grow and how uh, land is increasingly uh, uh, um, 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 you have these, these systems where perennial and forest components are being kind of converted into farmland and you also have systems where where the role of livestock which was very important in some cases has declined so we have less manure to go into soils uh, less um, less organic matter. I think Johannes is going to get into that. Um, and then kind of the overall disruption of the soil ecosystem that Johannes was talking about with, with tillage as that occurs. Um, and all of those things, I think, if, if we think about soil health as being uh, physical, uh, biological, chemical, having chemical fertility aspects, that those are all kind of uh, threats. Um, the the uh, I would say that a really key thing, we may be, depending on where we're from, we may be used to systems in which there's a lot of organic matter around. Uh, here in the US, we think of raking the leaves every fall. Uh, many cases, smallholders face real, real constraints for organic matter that they can put into the soil. And that's a real key for soil health that I think is gonna be part of this session as well. Um, so, I and then in response to those things, I think it's finding often, uh, trying to find synergies where uh, you have, for example, um, uh, you know, uh, I also met, I should mention also erosion is a real threat. So if you can combine functions like uh, providing forage for animals by having a live barrier, which provides forage for animals, which helps you to have manure, but also can, can stop erosion. This is a real, uh, so these multifunctional aspects of 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 um, of components in farms and landscapes. So that's one of one of the big responses I think has been, and you can see that in um, uh, just the overall idea of closing residue loops or closing nutrient cycling loops in systems. Um, for example, the use of human urine has been something that has increasingly been sort of a, a neglected resource. Sort of finding the finding the key things that are maybe missing in the system, or 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 fine fine tuning the the uh, or, or finding additional residue. Uh, sources which can be brought, brought into into so play. So here's where we're getting at some of the the positive trends or some of the solution set that you're seeing out there. Um, let's pause for a second and stay on the diagnosis before we get to the cure. That's fine. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I didn't want to neglect the the positive yeah. things, but the, yeah, I, yeah. I think you definitely want to get there. But um, the trends are um, maybe if I listen to you, I think there's all these trends of good good trend good good positive movements happening. Um, is that on the backdrop of some some other negative trends that you're seeing? And and I'm wondering if you could bring us specifically to the Andes. I know you've worked there for a long time, and someone has asked about the quinoa system. So maybe you could just tell us the the just the basics there. Oh sure, yeah. So so I would say the the trends in the Andes I think are that in these hill slope soils uh, like all over the world this is huge issues of erosion so as you disrupt uh, originally more perennial soil system uh, where which had soil cover throughout many years and then was fall fallowed and then brought back into production as you increasingly till that more and more on on slopes at least erosion becomes a huge factor and basically you're you're just you're losing the entire soil uh, uh, top horizon or layer of the soil, which which then, you know, is really the productive part of the soil. So it has a huge negative impact. Specific to the quinoa system, I would say, is also wind erosion, because this is actually not a terribly hilly place where quinoa is generally grown for export in Bolivia, at least. Um, but you do have this issue that you have a kind of a, a perfect storm of um, price, which now is going down, actually, but this the price boom in quinoa drove a lot of expansion into previously perennial areas, those were tilled, 
Then you have wind erosion. You have kind of a dust bowl scenario, which we actually had here in the United States in the 1920s and 30s. Um, and, and, uh, and I would also say that you have, as you do that, you eliminate livestock from the system and the perennial components that were providing manure. So you go, you go more and more into kind of a zero input only export kind of trend, which is, which is, a, which illustrates, I guess, a, another trend, which is that as you lose organic inputs and either focus into no inputs or just inorganic inputs or just fertilizers that you lose the, the really important role of organic matter in soils. And so, the, so what you see is then is this kind of yield crash in the, in the quinoa systems. Um, and that of course is, is interestingly being driven sometimes by markets which are calling themselves organic. And so that's not a terribly uh, con yeah. self-consistent yeah. <laughs> system. <Yeah. laughs> Overwhelmingly ironic. Yes. Um, Johannes, would you be interested in weighing in with any cases that illustrate some global trends from your experience? Um, well, I uh, from from our work in in across Africa, um, we keep seeing uh, losses of organic matter, and and that would tick uh, a, a negative box on on the soil health indicator list. Um, and that is still continuing. We're still bringing a lot of soils out of uh, natural ecosystems um, and or they have been brought out of natural ecosystems in the last 20, 10, 20 years. And their soil organic matter is still declining and keeps declining over the next few decades. Um, and those farmers are still in a or will be, uh, come into a more and more precarious situations um, managing their soils. Uh, for high productivity with ever lower soil organic matter contents and and uh, and and there is not enough carbon to go around right it's 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 always good to say well just put compost on but where do you get the compost yeah make your compost from what um and uh, and and it's so so i think it's i i feel it's a little bit of a time bomb still that we're still sitting on it's its uh, soils continue to degrade in, in much of um, of the tropical agro ecosystems uh, and uh, especially in smallholder agricultural systems and and um, uh, there's there are not enough clever ways or implemented clever ways to arrest soil carbon losses um, and because um, the soil organic meta is is this tight uh, um, balance between how much you put in and how much you lose, um, it, it, it really it very easily slips down. Um, and that's something we need to make sure is, is not happening uh, uh, at the scale that I think it is at, at the moment uh, almost inevitable. Yeah, okay. So uh, I think we had an earlier exchange today about this, the initiative to put more carbon into the soil and out of the atmosphere. So before we uh, touch on that and other other things that might be done, perhaps you could just tell us more about this idea of organic matter. So we've heard from your prior comments so far, the comments on this conversation that soil organic matter is a huge factor in soil health. Um, what is it exactly? Um, what is what is the material really, hmm. and what is it, um, what is managing it mean? Um, yeah, that's so that that's really. I if if you take just one parameter um, of soil health, uh, if you have only one shot to analyze something, you probably would analyze soil organic matter, um, uh, or precisely would analyze carbon as uh, the major component of soil organic matter, um, organic carbon, and and we are we're really seeing a a huge shift. Um, first in the scientific community over the last 10, 20 years, but increasingly also a public debate, um, uh, what the ramifications are from our, our shift in perception what soil organic matter is. We have been learning, when I grew up as a student, I, I learned that there is something called humus, um, and, uh, and that humus or soil organic matter is formed um, by a synthesis, um, microbial and abiotic synthesis, two so-called humic substances. Um, and these humic substances are large molecules uh, that, that stay in the soil for a long period of time, and they do all kinds of wonderful things. Uh, they make the soil dark and fertile, they have nutrients in it, they hold on to nutrients, um, 
and uh, and they stay for a long period of time and therefore um, maintain fertility. Now we are we're we're starting to to on a on a broader scale to uh, shift away from that notion of of uh, humification and uh, and humus building in in the context of large recalcitrant molecules towards the recognition that um, plant material is eaten by microorganisms to ever smaller uh, um, molecules and CO2 comes out at the other end um, with important interactions of this organic matter with the mineral surfaces, the clay minerals, or in aggregation. Um, and, uh, and so what, what, keeps, what keeps organic matter, what holds organic matter in soil is not the formation of these super molecules called humic substances that are recalcitrant, uh, but the uh, interaction of um, known biomolecules, proteins with um, mineral surfaces or within aggregates. Um, and that, that immediately puts your focus away from making something that's recalcitrant that stays there to managing the balance between what you put in, what you protect on the way out. Um, and so the, and, and it makes eminent sense that we then uh, put our spotlight on tillage, for instance, uh, managing tillage in a way uh, that it um, uh, doesn't mineralize too much organic matter. Uh, it puts the spotlight on promoting aggregation in soil and not destroying aggregates. Um, and those are all implicitly have always been uh, management interventions that we knew promoted organic matter, but I think now we have uh, a better fundamental understanding to prioritize those management interventions and those uh, soil practices that that reduce losses uh, of soil organic matter. If our intent is to um, to keep organic matter rather than you know, building a, a humus, um, a, a supposedly recalcitrant humus and humic substances and, and and that is really an, an important shift um, that uh, has been has been slow coming uh, historically um, and is of course you know, a, a, a very um, uh, a little bit of a contentious issue because it's uh, we, we we're falling in love or we have always been in love with with humus and and this notion of a, a very special material, which it still is. It's a very special mixture of highly diverse materials, lots of microorganisms, um, hundreds of thousands, millions of organi diverse organisms in a handful of soil. Um, but uh, that that is now the next step to to understand this ecosystem and and manage the interactions of this ecosystem really understanding it as a system not as a as a, 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 a distinct um, molecule super molecule uh, that stays there for a long period of time okay. johannes can i ask whether um that view of things is in i mean we talk about you know time bomb i agree there's some really big concerns we have about soil health decline is that in some ways a um uh, maybe a more hopeful message on the time scale, because if we're not trying to build something which lasts a thousand years, maybe we have somewhat better chance to improve aggregation or these physical protections, uh, physical protection of organic mo molecules on shorter time scales. Or is it the same? There's still a, the same concern about trying to do things really for long term. Well, for, for one thing, I think uh, no, that's a very good question. For one thing, um, it's it's then not it demystifies um, the uh, uh, the the process and and rather than being a, an, an elusive um, uh, mechanism that we don't have control over, we we start you know, putting uh, our efforts exactly on those management interventions that uh, that that work, uh, such as you know, reducing tillage. We reduce tillage and no tillage practices in all its variations have come in our modern agriculture from the 60s, especially from uh, Brazil, um, and have been very successful there and are spreading uh, slowly across the world. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and those concepts are, are where they work. And once we understand that this is um, managing tillage wisely is a, is a very important aspect, 
um, then uh, the the results are are almost immediate within within a few cropping seasons. Um, uh, we might not always measure increases in in uh, total soil carbon, um, but uh, in most cases we see very rapid uh, effects on in, in several soil health indicators that are more sensitive than soil carbon, such as aggregation, for instance, which is a very, very okay. rapid indicator um, of, uh, of soil health. Um, while you're debunking myths, like the humus notion would be helpful, um, can you help me out with this idea about, I don't know, maybe it's my misperception, but uh, it seems like some people emphasize chemical fertilizer, like there's one sort of school of thought or one type of proponent of improving fertilizer access. And then a different group of people who are uh, sort of view fertilizers at the, as if they were bad for soil health. And um, is, are, are there trade-offs there or are these mutual? Is, are, is there some you know fake news here? What's, what's the story uh, in terms of uh, your philosophy at least of, of um, and, and how you perceive other philosophies about organic and inorganic um, inputs? Yeah, no, that's a that's a very good question, and that's that's another very contentious one. Um, and uh, no, that there's there are definitely proponents that say no, sustainability in soil health we can only build with organic amendments and organic nutrients, um, and others find that that's a dangerous way to go. Um, and uh, my, one basic fact is that that. Um, uh, soil uh, plants still take up inorganic nutrients right and and it doesn't matter to the plant um, whether the nitrate that it takes up or the ammonium ion that it takes up through the root surface comes from an organic molecule at some point or comes from a store-bought NPK fertilizer it doesn't matter at all um, and we know that plants need nutrients so we cannot we, we still have to give the plants nutrients. Now, it's also true um, that there are a lot of interesting rhizosphere ecology processes um, that help the root take up nutrients and uh, provide uh, disease resistance and all kinds of beneficial uh, effects that adding just nitrate will not provide. Um, we need to give the soil nutrients and there need to be, uh, sorry, the soil organic carbon and there need to be um, a, uh, a, a microbial population um, around the, the roots um, that, uh, that, that is part of this, this soil health concept that we can uh, in some way link to soil health in the in the context of soil quality and soil productivity with respect to, to plant growth. Um, uh, but, um, and, and the other, so that, that's one aspect of, of plant nutrition. Uh, but then there is, of course, also the aspect of where do you get the nutrients from uh, and how do you administer it? Uh, and how much, how precisely can you administer the nutrients? And, and of course, we've spent a lot of time uh, adding inorganic nutrients in our modern agriculture, and we know much more about it um, than adding in, uh, uh, adding organic nutrients. So there's also a knowledge gap um, that we still need to catch up with organic amendments. Um, but obviously, adding an inorganic fertilizer uh, is much easier to time. It's it's less bulky. You can you can put it at a certain location at a certain time. Whereas spreading manure doesn't work at some uh, times of the of the cropping cycle. Um, so you need to change your whole philosophy of of how you add nutrients, um, and and that is uh, in some ways not as easy, and very often also um, is not less leaky. Um, we have seen experiments where uh, having uh, nitrogen provided by legume cover crops led to even more nitrogen leaching than if we would have applied uh, nitrogen fertilizer to the crop because it's much more difficult than to to retain the nutrients. Um, on the other hand, there's plenty of, of research that shows um, once you have that you can figure it out um, and uh, uh, that you you manage uh, nitrogen with nitrogen fixing plants uh, and satisfy crop uh, um, non legume crop nitrogen needs uh, as if you had given um, inorganic nutrients so so it is 
it is possible. Um, uh, it is it is a learning exercise. Uh, it might not work everywhere and in every cropping system um, and under all climates and soils. Uh, but there are enough examples around that uh, shifting to a more organic crop rotational legume based systems uh, can work in many, many situations. Um, but um, oh, it's as, as so often, uh, it's not one size fits all. Um, and uh, and um, very often uh, vague answers and perceived uncertainties is just variability. Something is good here and not there. No, you, 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 with everything, if you, you need to have a, a smorgasbord of, of options in front of you to choose one um, for the, the right edaphic soil and socioeconomic situation. I would just I would just add to that that I, I feel like there's and this is again from the perspective of farmers and, and looking at farmer management systems, farm farmer knowledge systems, that often the, the environment is one of very severe constraints. And so there may be questions of affordability that have to do with fertilizers. Um, this is one reason why like legume type of interventions are sometimes even preferred by farmers to, to in, in rotations. Uh, I, I guess the, the message for me is everything has a constraint and then it's not also either or. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the most important findings I think have, have been about how fertilizer and organic matter can interact positively to give sustained kind of more of a sustained nutrient release across the rotation and to hold nutrients better within the soil in a more available way. Um, so that's a really, I think that's just a really key uh, key notion. And and uh, so, so maybe we're not choosing just one alternative, what's perfectly possible. And in many, uh, actually in many uh, traditional farmer knowledge systems, you see that at, at work, you know, kind of the combination of different synergistic uh, practices. I guess that's the integrated soil fertility management school yes, of thought. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, you know, I guess the research says that there's some research on where that works and where it doesn't. I think there's something which says it works better in sandy soils. The organic, the function of organic matter works better in sandy soils than maybe in clay. So, so you get into this question of, yeah, it doesn't, not everything works everywhere, as Johannes is saying. And, and, and that's an important reason to kind of stick with it, I think, sometimes on, on this on the research angle is to really look at the local system where you're working and, and figure out what options you're taking from from this global smorgasbord and, and how those get combined locally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm completely with you. Um, and, uh, and and we know it, it, even in situation and we know that from the Dust Bowl in the US, even in situations where we have all the inorganic fertilizer that we want to have, um, if we are losing too much organic matter or if something's wrong with you know, the soil health as we define it at the moment, um, then, then even all the nutrients that you can afford will not um, uh, achieve this, the, the productivity that you want. And, um, but, but the, other, the, the opposite is also true. Now, I, I, I get uh, sometimes uh, uh, a little bit upset if, if especially in, in the development uh, circles, um, we we think uh, no around here we we can afford all the in the U.S. we can afford all the inorganic fertilizers so um, uh, no, organic matter amendments is, is a luxury um, but we and we can get great yields with that um, but we want every smallholder in sub-Saharan Africa please to only use compost and not NPK because it's bad for you um, and and that locks them in perpetual poverty and food insecurity. Um, and, and, and I think that is not fair either. Um, so I think, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, a, a very, also very contentious issue and, and debate. Um, and, and this fraught with uh, doing good and, uh, and trying to do good and maybe doing bad while you're doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the intention is not to constrain the philosophy or choices of, of any yeah. given farmer, but to offer, offer them uh, well, not just offer them options, but explain the implications of those different options. And I think as one thing Jan is saying also is that, so to, to not to forget that many of these systems have been very depleted over many years is a really important point mm -hmm. that, that we're not talking, we, we don't want to continue kind of zero input practices. That's the, or, or practices where it's very hard to access things like, um, or make enough compost, let's say, for example. Yeah, exactly. Because as, as you said, no, it's not just the carbon, it's also where do the nutrients come from. And if you're just recycling nutrients, but never importing nutrients from outside the farm gate, you 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 will 
only deplete uh, the nutrient reserves and uh, and without imports uh, from outside the farm gate or outside your community, that community will never come up uh, in productivity. Um, so we we do need inorganic in, infusion of inorganic nutrients from somewhere in some form into these uh, nutrient depleted agroecosystem landscapes. And and that that can include tightening the the nutrient cycling loops within the community. Yeah. So yes. So, okay. Yeah. So, so it seems like these, the health idea yeah. and analogy is actually working pretty well in the conversation from what I'm hearing, that you really have to understand, you have to have a good diagnosis, what's good and what, are, what, what, what things are limiting in your soil, what are the healthy and unhealthy dimensions of your soil, and then, you know, don't be shy to build the one that you need. If, it's, if you really need organic matter, you've got to do that. If you need nutrients to be uh, uh, nutrient levels to be increased, then you know there's no way around that either. So okay, um, so let, let's now look at coming back to the issue of organic matter. Um, how can and 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 not to shy away from nutrients either. How can farmers say in resource limited developing country situations build organic matter, and also how can they do so in industrialized settings or do they need to? So what are the options that farmers have for building organic matter? Yeah, um, and that's not easy uh, because organic matter has multiple uses. Uh, we are on the front end constrained by photosynthesis. There's only so much plants on a given area of land can uh, fix carbon dioxide and transform into organic matter. And then the goal is to um, make the best use of it. And as a soil scientist and to talking about soil, uh, of course, we want to maximize uh, soil uh, carbon input into the soil and retaining it there. Um, and, uh, and, and it dramatically depends on, on the, the, obviously the, the climate, the soils and, and the agroecosystem. Um, but uh, uh, having, using organic matter from uh, the initial um, uh, plant fixation multiple times, for instance, as a feed um, uh, for animals and then the manure putting on the soil um, uh, is, uh, is, is a good way to, to, to use organic matter twice or three times in an agroecosystem system rather than just once. Uh, so recycling is uh, very important that we capture it, that we don't lose it. Um, uh, instead of um, um, having uh, organic matter discarded, uh, collect it, uh, possibly make compost out of it, um, uh, put it on the soil, uh, retaining crop residues, um, maintaining a critical amount of, of soil cover is very important. Um, that speaks to you know, making sure that, that your crop residues are not completely eaten by uh, by by your roaming animals, um, that is often very challenging because different communities sometimes own animals, so uh, you you have then uh, neighborly disputes. Um, but but also um, that uh, it is not easy to confine uh, uh, animals very often, um, and uh, and then uh, retain retain as much carbon as possible in in the soil once you have added it uh, with appropriate management such as for instance reducing tillage as much as possible um, I, I think very important aspects nowadays are also to um, look beyond the farm gate and with we have this traditional historic separation uh, in the in the food pyramid and and uh, um, where uh, hundreds of years ago and, and and still in some communities, um, primary production by by uh, photosynthesis, crops, uh, animal uh, production, and human uh, consumption were intricately linked. We are now separating those. We have cities. Um, we we are transporting nutrients and carbon away from farms, and, and then we have very often a disposal issue uh, in cities. We really need to figure out how we how we truly make headway in a circular economy to bring. Uh, carbon and nutrients back um, from where they are consumed the most, and that's typically not in an agricultural landscape, um, but but then in in towns and cities. Um, so I think that is the next frontier to figure out how we can recycle carbon, because otherwise we will uh, continue to deplete carbon and nutrients 
uh, in agricultural watersheds. There's there's no way around that. It does seem crazy that we create so many problems for ourselves with harmful algal blooms and just lack of sanitation by not treating um, you know human organic wastes with the kind of respect and you know for, for the utility that they potentially have. So. Yeah, I've, I've been having those conversations today. And so I wanted to ask you, I'm going to circle back and ask you in a bit about biochar. But meanwhile, I want to ask you for any guesswork from either of you or informed guesswork about how um, how much potential is that? Is there there to uh, reduce greenhouse gases like or is that a is that a is that something that could happen? Is would massive soil recarbonization have any potential to deal with, you know, decarbonization of the atmosphere, or are those links non-existent or li very limited? I mean, I guess you, 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 if you've got greater ag productivity by having better, you know, sources of fertility and soil health, you'd get greater productivity potentially, which would fix more carbon. But it, is is there is there anything there in terms of the the <laughs> I mean, I think it, sort of the implications of the fact that I think soil carbon is, I mean, soil carbon is quite a bit greater than forest carbon globally, right? So, and a lot of that, a lot of that may be in northern soils and high elevation soils, but still the idea that soil carbon is this massive pool of, of carbon, which can either stay in the soil or be built or be broken down. And that's a, that's a, that's a basic fact. Um, so yes, there's huge potential, potential theoretically, right, to use the use soil as as a carbon sink. From where I stand with a smallholder farmer, I think just avoiding further losses is is kind of the name of the game. And then, uh, you know, as we do learn about really these uh, optimistic visions and, and kind of um, thinking about what what Johannes was just talking about with, you know, creating circular more circular economies, then yes, that that has the potential to do something. Um, I, I see the, sh the shorter term challenge is just to, to stop the depletion um, and, that, and also to see the benefits that that can bring to smallholder farmers, right, to have soil health. Um, so, so, but, but that may be a very different picture for, for industrial agriculture, which is just a huge, now a huge sector of the, of the global agriculture, of course. Mm. So maybe, I don't know if Johannes, you want to continue on that? Yeah, no, I completely agree. And, and, and it is the inconvenient uh, truth that there is just a, a very mightily few opportunities for actively withdrawing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, it's just not a lot around that we can deploy today. And um, uh, putting carbon into soil and increasing soil carbon stocks is just the low-hanging fruits, cheaper and immediately deployable than anything else that uh, IPCC and other bright minds are coming up with at this point. Yeah, right? There's a benefit that nothing else would have. Like even if you were able to stuff CO2 into the, you know, holes in the ground in some cave somewhere, I mean, that might be good for the climate change perspective, but there's no sort of secondary benefit. Whereas if you get that carbon into soil, it's going to immediately turn around and help you bring down carbon in the form of producing food. So it's hard not to be enthusiastic. Plus, uh, uh, Steve, you mentioned that a uh, farmer organization in West Africa that is um, rebranding human urine as as a fertilizer and, and doing very well with that. And having spent the last couple of weeks there, um, I come back very inspired by that and very curious about how mm -hmm. to go beyond using household wastes to fertilize small women's fields for household food security, which is a beautiful thing. But as Johannes mentioned, trying to connect from those towns and cities and blurring the line between you know urban or rural to create these nutrient loops that have so much more potential than just a few rural households. So um, having spoken about that with some people there and um, you know and here in France where agroecology and uh, the four per thousand effort mm -hmm. is getting underway. Yeah, I mean I have to say that I'm personally very keen to try to nudge that along. Certainly, certainly happy to hear from anybody who's on the line about how you feel about the potential to, uh, I think there would be some, you know, good rebranding and, you know, going to use human waste and both food waste, you know, before and after consumption, you know, food waste, there's at least quite a bit of it in some places and, and then post consumption waste. So let me, let me come back to this issue of biochar because it, it has potentially a role to play. Um, I'm, you know, 
would mention a student that Johannes and I uh, were, were both on the committee for myself in a much less important position, but her work was quite inspiring. Um, I think we all know Lila Kumbi and who did her PhD in the Nairobi slum context. Um, there's toileting work there in terms of improving sanitation. And then once sanitation is improved through improved toilet facilities, you know, then you have protect the possibility of, of having your, your hands essentially on the product that might be usefully turned into fertilizer. And so she was working on that. So um, you've obviously done a tremendous amount more than that, Johannes, in terms of other things that you've done in terms of trying to make use of waste streams, turning them into fertilizer. Would you mind commenting a bit on your work on biochar and, you know, how, how yeah. does that fit the picture? Yeah, no, that that's a good point. And, and, no, the, the, the trick is um, to make a, uh, a market-ready fertilizer product that can seamlessly enter uh, existing markets and has sufficient value that it warrants transportation because that's the essential issue um, that, that we have um, spatially segregated and sectorially segregated uh, consumption from, from production. Um, and uh, making it a product that that can be transported and traded as any other fertilizer that we are at the moment transporting from from China, Morocco, or or the U.S. all over the world, such as phosphates. Um, and uh, and and um, so one challenge is that a lot of waste streams are uh, very uh, contain a lot of water. Uh, so you need to, and water doesn't have any value um, uh, transported. <laughs> uh, so we need to get the water out. Um, but we also need to, um, we don't necessarily need oxygen and hydrogen in there. Uh, so we might want a, a carbon dense and nutrient dense product um, that has a high value as a soil amendment. Uh, and we need to take care of all kinds of um, unwanted uh, 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 components in there, pathogens, of course, come to mind if you're thinking about human feces and sludges, um, but also uh, other endocrine disruptors, microplastics, hormones, antibiotics, um, uh, not only from human remains, but also from uh, dairy or poultry or hog uh, manures um, that, that share a, a lot of the same traits and are usually point sources somewhere that we need to uh, look at and and find ways of of uh, producing a high value product. The other challenge is um, that we uh, we have nitrogen is is usually a big story in there, and uh, nitrogen conversion uh, nitrogen exists as a gas as well. So uh, figuring out technology solutions that that um, make a a very low nutrient dense soup <laughs> uh, into a high nutrient dense uh, dry material is is challenging and that's a lot of groups worldwide are working on this uh, and uh, precipitating struvite comes to mind is is one of the most advanced technologies has its has its advantages and disadvantages we've been looking at at um, a uh, what's called thermochemical a, a uh, um, uh, sort of charring, uh, heating um, technique where we densify materials through heat um, and uh, drive off water uh, and uh, and oxygen and hydrogen separately uh, to make a, a nutrient dense material and then try to precipitate uh, ammonia gas on it uh, from from the liquid uh, phase of, of urine. Uh, so those are approaches um, and there are many others that need to be tried out. Um, that are are attractive, especially if they can guarantee that uh, all the hormones and antibiotics and microplastics and um, and uh, pathogens are destroyed in the process. And 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 that, of course, is is not easy. Um, composting is one approach, but has has a, a very very big disadvantages because not always do we destroy hormones and antibiotics. Actually, mostly not. Uh, even even pathogens are are rarely we, we're really safely destroying all pathogens uh, through composting only if it's a really good composting intervention um, uh, that is that reliably the case so so that that's a really it's a it's a moving uh, field and and I think a, a very important field um, to to uh, to look at you mentioned the transportation issue the transport of heavy things like watery fertilizers and I must say that 
on that point, I feel just, just from the conversations I've been having in West Africa, somehow, you know, just because the trucks have to bring the agricultural produce from the countryside to the city. So, I, I mean, I just sort of started to visualize why shouldn't there be more of a two-way traffic? What's going, are those trucks going empty out into the, you know, the rural um, catchments that are bringing grain together? So I'm just curious about that issue. You know, assuming it's not something that's going to be extremely dangerous to contaminate the truck or something, but anyway. Um, I, I see a potential reason for, I mean, that this, this doesn't have to be, a, you know, something which happens immediately, right? And the fact is that lots and lots of agriculture right now is happening in peri-urban areas where those, those uh, supply chain uh, linkages are not, so, are not so long and the residues are sort of more, in, so either composting or kind of a biochar or other stabilizing uh, solution um, maybe can, can be piloted at that scale. And then you see how far, I mean, it seems like transporting something like compost or any other manure product way back into the hinterland will probably never happen. That may be more the role of kind of a uh, combined fertilizer product or, or 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 something, but but there's ways to try to, you know, sort of make progress on this incrementally. I think that's a really key thing. Just explore where the niches are, where it can work first, and mm -hmm. then see how far you take it. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Rebecca. Well, no, I want to just go ahead and wrap that up because I wanted to take a look at some of the questions that have come in from our audience today. So wanted to. We've got about eleven more minutes, so I just want to make sure we give some time for that. But carry yeah. on. And pass to Oh, just a, a, a fine comment on that. that no, um, exactly right, uh, Steve. It's it's uh, that's why it's so important to have um, a uh, of a market ready, very dense material that can store. Because you know, uh, conceptually, there has to be more material mass, uh, carbon and nutrients going from the agricultural landscape into the city than vice versa. So so by just using the transportation pathways. Um, that it is always um, a, a greater transport into the cities than than backwards. So if we make materials that can then be stored, um, because it's a timing issue, obviously, uh, that you need the fertilizer at the beginning of the season and you you produce uh, or you transport the produce at the end of the season, um, and if you and and uh, uh, animal manure or compost can't be stored for half a year, uh, but if you can store bags of of nutrient dense fertilizers. Um, then you can, in fact, use the same transportation pathways uh, and times. Yeah. Great point. Um, so Michel Barbier has asked us about um, in the in the context of minimum tillage, which you were mentioning the issue of soil disturbance or trying to reduce that. Um, mentioned um, Marcel mentioned the the issue about glyphosate being having such an important role in those no-till, low-till systems but he's pointing out some of the problems that have been associated with that. He says glyphosate has been used, but its use decreases root mycorrhization, soil um, AMF, spore biomass, vesicles, and propagules. Please comment. Anybody want to weigh in on information relating to the downside of using glyphosate? Yeah, which is also not to mention some of the some of the recent health findings. I think, right? There's some confirmatory well, exactly, research yeah. about uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, yeah, certainly um, that is a that is a, some downside. I would say that there's also, if, in specific reference to AMF, to and that's um, so that's my our vascular my, mycorrhizae, um, which are these helpful symbiotic organisms which help uh, plants to access phosphorus and other nutrients in in um, just, I mean, just plain fertilization will will do that as well. So glyphosate may not be the only thing that's acting there uh, in in these no-till systems. Um, but certainly, if you're if you're adopting a soil health promoting technology which which affects biota negatively, uh, and you think that those biota are really important to the picture, then that that bears some thought. That really needs to be to be thought through. What are other ways we we can do that? Um, you know, completely zero tillage in organic systems has been very slow in coming because it's been very hard to do, but reducing the amount of tillage in many types of systems has been possible. Um, and that can happen across the rotation as well. So integration of perennial components and, and other things. Um, so anyway, I would just, so just maybe widening the lens a little bit, but but yeah, point well taken um, mm. about negative impacts on biota. Yeah. No. And that's why why uh, there is a, a broad interest in 
in cover crops and figuring out how we can kill the cover crops uh, in time for planting the, the food crop uh, without reducing or without having a lot of competition um, with, with the food crop. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's that, that has been, as Steve said, slow and coming, but a really important area of research and development. So I think some of the comments that we have received have been answered through the course of the conversation. Um, is there- I wanna, I see if, sorry, can I just say something about, so, so microdosing, there's some mention of microdosing and, and um, uh, kind of uh, the, the footprints of organic fertilizers. I, I hope we've been answering them. I think that our conversation has been very uh, big picture, like we want to solve soil carbon, whereas maybe we're neglecting some of these 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 little innovations, which are I won't say little; they're, they're actually quite important. Um, like like increasing the efficiency of organic matter use, of fertilizer use, um, making use of perennial components like like tree hedgerows or other hedgerows and systems, which are really accessing different, sometimes different pools of of nutrients and water so that they increase the agriculture productivity of the system. I don't want to ignore those either. I think those can be really important at a, at a smallholder scale. So I just wanted and to actually, say that. Steve, I'm remiss because I actually invited you to join our discussion because I was hoping you were going to tell us about your soil toolkit too in that spirit to some extent. I, I, I totally I appreciate the comment that you just made about increasing efficiency through the time and placement, you know, time, place and um, yeah, yeah, but we can address some of these other questions. Yeah, there's. I, I'll just say very quickly that there are different efforts to to assess uh, assess soil health in a rapid way. Um, we are working on that, and many other people are working on that. And the idea is that you can have a quicker feedback to either to improvements. And the other thing we've been understanding with working with with organizations is that just just increasing kind of the the knowledge capital about soils through the use of this toolkit among farmers, among the organizations that, that work with them. Uh, who sometimes have kind of simplistic uh, understanding of things, that, that's also a big benefit. Uh, maybe that's the initial benefit. And, and tracking progress is actually quite difficult, I would say, given the tools we have now. Understanding the context and the appropriateness of different options, is, is a, there's, a, there's a good payoff there. And then tracking progress is something we, we really are working on. And having that be meaningful to farmers, I think. OK, yeah. So I do think that's an important note. Insofar as we're talking about health, getting the diagnosis right so that then what you implement is appropriate for the context. I think that your toolkit should be relevant there. But now Richard Williams has weighed in to point out opportunities from biodigesters that are um, making energy from waste or even from crops. I, I just as um, after West Africa, I spent a couple of days in Germany where the landscape was full of biogas production and farmers are growing corn to make energy using those um, biogas facilities and, and finding it quite efficient. So. Um, yeah, I want to get to Richard's suggestion here that the way the um, the the byproducts of the um, biodigesters, I mean, would they be suitable for um, as soil amendments? Did I get you right, Richard? Okay, let me quote him exactly. Are there not some opportunities from biodigesters which are making energy from waste products, then producing a more transportable nutrient product for soil? Any any reaction to that or? Yeah, I, I think that's a, um, a, a good suggestion. Uh, it, it goes to uh, into that whole idea of trying to use the carbon as often as possible. So using animal manure or crop residues first in a biodigester of some kind, generating methane from that to power um, kitchen or electricity um, heat, uh, and and that will not reduce the carbon content much. No, it's maybe a, a few ten percent um, at maximum. Uh, we're still left with most of the mass afterwards that we can use for something else. Um, uh, and uh, but but then we we still have a very wet slurry in most cases because most digestion systems are are wet digestion. Uh, there are modern dry digestion methods, um, but mostly wet digestion is used. So to transport what's remaining after digestion um, uh, somewhere else, we still need to find a way to get the water out 
um, and uh, and making a nutrient and carbon dense material, and and that's been the challenge, especially with respect to to nitrogen. Um, so precipitating phosphorus or nitrogen and or nitrogen out, um, and thinking more about potassium than uh, is is the name of the game. But yeah, putting putting digestion in the middle there makes excellent because methane is so much more valuable as an energy carrier than uh, just um, uh, uh, combusting or, or pyrolyzing uh, the remains. Um, so it's a very good use of, um, of a wet slurry from animal manure, for instance. Mm -hmm. Great. I'd like um, to also remember that the original biodigester and, and uh, bioenergy source, and not to poo-poo all the innovations, it's really interesting to see what's going on, but the, that the ruminant, which of course is a little maligned because of its methane emissions at, at large scale at least, the ruminant is kind of the smallholder farmer's original digester where they're creating a useful waste product and getting energy out for tillage or for other and, and other products. So these multifunctional. After the methane, you know, maybe we're good. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So Lokesh Kumar has asked, is there any harm to water agricultural land with treated sewage water having a high load of ammonia and nitrogen? Um, which certainly done, um, there's a lot of uh, use of dairy waste where in our the, the upstate New York area where Cornell is located, uh, dairy waste are put on the soil and, and there certainly is an issue of runoff of nitrogenous waste from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so managing wastes according to nutrient demands rather than uh, as as a pure waste management strategy. That's a, that's of course the idea um, of making a market ready fertilizer so that you adjust nutrient applications with these kind of fertilizers according to crop demands and not by your need to get rid of the stuff um, and uh, and so um, there, there is a component of ammonia I'm guessing um, uh, Lokesh was really referring to ammonia the gas um, uh, that is a problem uh, that a lot of the uh, organic wastes can have a relatively high pH so we are we might lose a lot of ammonia gas um, and we need to manage that too I think in, in many countries um, that is done by um, by mixing it to drive the pH down or injecting the material um, that minimizes gaseous losses of, of nitrogen um, and uh, and and that's that's of course um, requires certain equipment that uh, is available um, only in, in select locations and is expensive at this point. So um, easier would be if we, and and obviously a, a wet sludge is, is very difficult to transport costly and we know that that um, transporting uh, animal, wet animal manure for more than 10, 15 kilometers costs more than the nitrogen value uh, that it contains. So, so making a, a nutrient and uh, and dry nutrient dense and and dry material out of out of wet what is typically wet waste is is absolutely essential. Otherwise, this doesn't make uh, much sense. Okay. Well, it's very interesting to think about all the clever options and engineering that can go in now to making that that fertilizer. But I have to say, it's we're now at the end of our hour. So, I would like to give a huge thanks to the to the two of you, uh, Johannes and Steve, thanks so much for joining us, really appreciate that. And to those who have joined us online and to Lauren for organizing. So thanks everyone, thanks so much for those who have typed in comments and- um, yeah. uh, Thanks a lot, those, sorry for any questions we left unresolved. Yeah, yeah, there's some sort of general questions and I, I hope and want to believe that those were addressed through the course of the conversation insofar as it's possible to address them. Sometimes we don't have all the answers. So some of them are big questions for which I'm not sure we have answers. But uh, So best wishes to everyone. Um, good luck with the rest of the course. Have a great day. Those of you who are early, have a great night. For those of you who are, who are late, and take care. Best wishes, everyone. Yeah, take care. Bye-bye.